in 2015. And I'll just go through a little bit about what CAMH is about, what our partnership is with Corrections, and a little bit about some of the creative pathways we've created that sort of come from FICE. Let's see if my slides will move. There we go. So I'm sure most of you, if you're from the GTA area, will know what CAMH is, but um, it's important, I think, to understand that we are a large uh, hospital and um, we have over 3,000 employees, many programs. Uh, our program is situated in the forensic stream of our services, uh, where the inpatient beds are uh, considered forensic beds. We have 193 of those. We have 350 forensic outpatient clients that you know were falling under the ORB and are now uh, housed in the community. Plus, we have uh, general psychiatry, schizophrenia program, addiction services, youth programs. All that to say that FICE is just one little program in a conglomerate of many programs at CAMH. So while I am representing CAMH, just uh, to be mindful, we are just one branch of that. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just one, one piece of a bigger, a bigger company. So the Forensic Early Intervention Service, FICE for short, was started in 2015 um, in the Toronto South Detention Centre, and we then expanded to Vanier in, the 20, in 2017. So we were seen as a component of the forensic mental health system, and it complements the services that are already being provided by the healthcare teams at the Toronto South and Vanier. So we're not the primary caregiver. Uh, we don't actually uh, apply the treatments. We work in collaboration with the, the healthcare teams within these institutions. And that's an important point to hold on to as we go through the, the presentation. And so the goal of the program when, we, when it started, and uh, it was many years in the making, was to sort of be able to provide timely access to clients who are on a forensic pathway uh, and who had been in, you know, in custody and had come, in come into contact with legal services and the law and their mental health uh, was perhaps the reason they were involved with the justice system. So we know that these people um, historically had, did not have access or easy access to the mental health system. And we wanted to ensure that, they, that, that a team could be in place to help navigate the complex system. So as I mentioned, this is the Toronto South location, and we moved in when it was brand new, a new facility, which was actually the merging of three other jails. And uh, it was the old Mimico Center, uh, the Toronto um, West, West Detention Center, and the Don Jail. So it's an all-male facility. It's quite a large facility, and uh, it's a maximum secure facility. So when we started FICE, um, because this program, this, this institution was new, it really made a nice segue to start a new program such as FICE uh, inside of it, because everything was new. At the Vanier Center for Women, which we started in 2017, it was a little bit different. It wasn't a new facility. It's not a new facility. Um, and so when we started there, there was a lot more things that we had to adjust and acclimatize to their already set up system. So we could start fresh at Toronto South and build a new system. And at Vanier, we worked with what they had and uh, adjusted our approach to, to match their, their long established services. So as you can see, as I mentioned, they're big. When Toronto South is actually full, it can hold up to 1,650 inmates. 320 uh, what they would call intermittent sentencing, which is usually the weekend uh, people. Now the intermittent center has been closed since COVID and the running number uh, for people right now was around 1100 to 1200 daily at the Toronto South. Vanier is much smaller in an older designed building. They can hold up to 333 and they usually run somewhere in the 200s, low 200s, but very differently designed units. And so the population that we work with are remanded uh, offenders, is the, the term they use here, offenders. Uh, and that means that they haven't been sentenced. So if a client is sentenced, FICE is not able to, to work with them. So we work with the people who are awaiting their court hearings and their dispositions and have yet to be sentenced. Most of the people we work with are from the GTA. Uh, of course, out in Vanier, we would get people as far away as Hamilton and Kitchener. Uh, and again, the population is very diverse and reflects the, the diversity of the, the GTA community. 
I believe the average length of stay for an inmate is 30 days, so it's a quick turnover. And I think that the majority of people are under 30 or around 30 that get admitted. So it's a younger, quick turnaround population. And so why FICE and what, what sort of helped us grow and become, what guided us to, the, to this program? Well, we knew that, uh, and, and research has shown for decades, that people with mental illness are overrepresented in prison. And we did know that they did not traditionally have easy access to mental health services. Traditionally, what a correctional institution was set up to do, and their mandate is security and public safety. They were not set up to be become a default treatment center for the mentally ill. They're not trained historically to work with the mentally ill. Their top priority is safety and security. And so imagine somebody coming in with mental illness and not having easy access to a specialized team. Uh, they could refuse court, as some of you might work in the courts know. They could miss hearing dates. They could refuse lawyers. And the staff at the correctional facilities traditionally wouldn't have time or the knowledge or access to, access to information to help move those cases along. They'd often be really stalled or difficult to manage. And so the program, when we first started, was is funded by um, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and the partnership between that and the Office of the Solicitor General. And uh, as I mentioned, it's for people who I fall under the provisions of the criminal code, which means FICE doesn't work with, and we'll go through this a little bit later, we don't work with every inmate who has a mental illness. We, we specialize and maintain on our caseload people who are at risk of being unfit or who are unfit to stand trial, or they may be pursuing the NCR pathway. And so just going through the numbers a little bit and talking about the need in prison, so this, this little uh, triangle kind of breaks it down a little bit. So most people who come into correctional setting, if we had 100 people come in, almost all of them would, would, would benefit for some help with addiction or substance use education supports. Some of them, maybe around 50%, have what we would consider just sort of maintain treatable, stable mental health concerns. So they might have a community team supporting them or they might have been depressed in the past but no longer uh, requiring medication or they might have an anxiety disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. Not to minimize any of those conditions, they all require support and care. But the ones that we're looking at are the people who are acutely unwell, who are really in crisis, whose mental health uh, hasn't been treated well or is not maintained and they, they're, they're more of a crisis, acutely unwell client. And again, their charges are uh, probably going to be under the, the criminal code with uh, mental health considerations. So those are the people that we want to work on our caseloads and want to see. We will definitely screen and work with the general population of mental health and those with substance use, but we won't keep them on our caseload. And I'll show you how that works. So this is the model of care, and it, it's kind of like this. It's based on the STAIR model, so screening, triage, assessment, intervention, and reintegration. And that's a model of care that was coined and developed by Dr. Sandy Simpson, our, forensic, our former forensic chief at uh, CAMH. He still works with uh, CAMH, but he's no longer our chair, but he's, and he's still with our uh, vice team. So screening and triage, assessment, and some of the intervention are all things that the FICE team can do. And I'll just let you know how it works. So on any given day uh, in A and D, inmates are brought in, for example, at the Toronto South, they're usually brought in from the, court, in from the, the police stations uh, in the evenings. Every inmate who comes in is screened with a tool called the Brief Jail Mental Health Screener. It's a very easy tool. I believe it's nine questions. And if you trigger that screening tool, uh, what happens is you get a your referral is get gets faxed to FICE, and our office is actually located here in the um, the upstairs the mezzanine. I'll show you later uh, at the Toronto South. So a fax comes in from A and D, and our team in the mornings pick up those new referrals. And what we do is we fan out across the jail. All the clinicians will have a meeting in the morning and we'll take those new referrals and we'll go out and meet with those inmates and do another screening 
which is called the JSAT, the Jail Screening Assessment Tool. What that tool does, it's really a biopsychosocial bio assessment. If anybody is uh, social workers in the call will understand that term. It really is a overview and, a, and not a deep dive, but an overview of the client's history, how they're doing, what concerns they have. We're kind of we're kind of querying: is there a mental illness here? Is there a need for an intervention? So every morning we take the new referrals, we do that, and then in the afternoon at three o'clock we have a team checkout meeting where we review all those new cases we've seen with our psychiatrists on, on board in our team meeting, and we decide who meets the mission criteria to FICE and who can we refer back to general healthcare services at the jail. So that's a little bit about the brief jail mental health screener here. You can see the tool and some of the questions seem very broad in general and that is done deliberately. Uh, one of the things that this tool aims to do is to sort of try to get the quietly unwell people. Everybody can recognize somebody coming in through admissions who's yelling and screaming and dysregulated. Those people are easy to flag. But a lot of times our clients are quietly psychotic, uh, suffering internally without sharing um, some of the things that are happening. They may be paranoid or suspicious. And this tool is aimed to sort of try to tease some of that out. So some of the questions like, um, do you feel like you have, you've talked more or moved more slowly in the last little while? Um, do you think that people may know your thoughts or read your mind? Do you believe that people can control your mind or people are putting thoughts in your head? So those questions are really, sort of kind of trying to tease out if people are quietly psychotic and feeling unwell. And so you can see if you answer yes to seven or yes to question eight, it's an automatic referral. So taking medications or been in hospital or at least two of the other one to six questions. So when we first rolled out this tool, Corrections said, well, everybody is going to be referred to us. And we said, that's OK. Let us decide. It's OK. We want to cast a wide net. We want to make sure we don't miss anybody. The next tool we use, as I mentioned, is the Jail Screening Assessment Tool, the JSAT. I won't go through the details, but it has like the typical demographic things. Uh, it does a little bit about addictions and substance use, talks about mental health treatments in the past, any issues, you know, suicide, homicidal thoughts, tries to tease over that. It's not meant to tease out that. It's not meant to be an, a, a diagnostic tool. Again, it's considered a screening tool. So our clinicians will do that. So I show you this picture because it is the Toronto South Detention Centre and I wanted to sort of highlight this. the stairs are no longer there just so you know this was pre-opening but our offices are up above the, the this unit the mental health unit. So this program both at the South and at Vanier are really really embedded in the in the in the uh, prison. So our office overlooks the mental health unit here at Toronto South and at Vanier we're housed in the healthcare office next to the nurses and the treatment room for the for the inmates. And that's something that makes our program really unique because it's a partnership where we're not outside consulting, we're actually hands on uh, inside the institution uh, working alongside the correctional colleagues which historically has not happened before. I mean as you know corrections is a is a system that is meant to be tightly secured, closed, put up the drawbridge, you have your cinder block walls, it's not meant to be open to the public. So having a healthcare provider come in um, all those many years ago in 2015 was a was a big deal at the time and still is. We, we still have a great partnership but it, was, it took a long time to sort of get this model in place. So our staffing model is a multidisciplinary team and we have social workers, nurses, occupational therapists, an advanced clinician, and we have daily coverage of psychiatry. And what's unique about that is each person on the team um, will do the JSAT assessments except the physicians. The physicians will actually, um, if, the, if the client is positive on the jail screener and we want to keep them on our caseload, then the psychiatrist becomes involved and they will actually do a more in-depth assessment then. The psychiatrist will actually do their own forensic um, assessment on the client looking for uh, not a diagnosis again because it's difficult to diagnose somebody in custody but they will look for uh, more things that we may need to tease out and treat and help support the client. So everybody is able to do the JSATs on the team. Uh, the piece I mentioned about being a partnership and working uh, collaboratively and consulting to the team 
is that we complete the JSATs and we return them to the Toronto South Healthcare team, the nurses and the social workers. The clients that we do flag for FICE, we will continue to case manage and support and work with the courts and their families and legal. Um, but the Toronto South will also work in partnership with us and those clients. So we're not the primary healthcare provider. FICE does not prescribe medication. We do not do hands-on treatment. We're, our nurses are not administering medication. Our uh, OTs are not doing functional assessments like you would see an OT do in, in, in a regular healthcare setting. So we're, we're consulting and sharing our advice and are uh, able to provide much more case services hours and management hours to those clients, but we're not the primary treatment. And as I mentioned before, the inclusion criteria is we're really looking for those acutely unwell. So those who are at risk of being unfit to stand trial or they're, they're unfit to stand trial, which you know, the court would find, or they may be pursuing an NCR pathway. So really, if you think about it, it's the acutely unwell. Another piece that's really important to remember and highlight is that FICE is a consent-based service. So clients can actually uh, refuse to work with us, decline working with us. They can also withhold consent for other partnerships, just like any client could. So the, they can say, yes, I'll work with you, uh, but I don't want you to call my lawyer, and we have to respect that. Um, they'll say, yes, you know, you can work with me, but I don't want to talk to the ACT team. Don't call my mother. Don't call my family, and that's fine. So it's a consent-based service. They have to want to participate. If a client said to us, I'll see you, CAMH, but I'm not talking to the jail, then we can't work because we have an open partnership with the jail and the clients are known, are, known, are told right from the beginning they need to know that we will be sharing information with the South or with Vanier. So that's the only exception. They can't, they can't withhold consent for us to speak with the Toronto South or Vanier. If they want to work with us, they have to take both of us together. And so this is just an overview of what I've already mentioned, which is the responsibilities uh, of each team. And again, it's, it really is a, a partnership. Uh, our team would work closely with psychology here, the social work team, uh, the nursing team. So they, at the Toronto South and at, and at Vanier, they have general duty nurses as well as mental health nurses. We would work with uh, the chaplain, um, and of course the program officers and uh, again we build a, an ongoing relationship in terms of uh, working on a treatment plan and discharge planning. Uh, we aim to have our JSAT, our screening tool, uh, turned around and sent back to them within 24 hours and what makes that really unique is that because we're a healthcare system and because we have an electronic health record many of the clients that we register already end up having services at CAMH. So once we get consent to work with those clients, we already often have a very rich collaborative history to share uh, about the client in terms of what medications they may be taking, when were they last in hospital, uh, who they last seen in the community, you know, do they have substance use history, so all of that stuff is often really ready, readily available to us. When we first started, we did a just a very general sort of uh, scan of our health records, and it was estimated that between 65 and 70 percent of the clients who came to Toronto South already had a CAMH health record. So that's a lot of people, right? Six, 65 out of 100 already had a CAMH health record. That's really valuable information that the Toronto South with paper records, no access to you know, healthcare charts. That's really valuable information to be able to share with them to provide you know, quick treatment and access to services. It's a little less, of course, at Vanier because Vanier is further outside of our catchment area, but we do see some people, um, a percentage of those who have accessed CAMH in the past, especially our, our addiction services. And I imagine um, most people at the um, hospitals in Oakville and uh, Milton would also have history on those people. And so that's a little bit about the role of what we do here at both the South and at Vanier in terms of our day-to-day -day work, providing triage, screening, assessment, and then the intervention being our case management uh, work with the court, 
with the lawyers, with the family, collateral, housing, all of those things that community caseworkers would do, we try to do from the, uh, the office here. What has grown from our role is that we have two staff here at uh, Vanier who also attend Old City Hall Court. So CAMH has a contract with Old City Hall Court to provide uh, kind of like administrative services in helping coordinate the forensic beds. So the Form 48 beds, the treatment order beds. Um, and so two people on the FICE staff are are uh, working uh, on that in that role as well as the court liaison workers. And so that gives us tremendous ability to coordinate and a fulsome understanding of how people enter into the forensic system or go into custody from a form 48. The limits, of course, is that as the as a court liaison worker, they're wearing a different hat than they are as a FICE worker. So under the court liaison role, they're providing more of an administrative duties and are not able to comment clinically on the uh, things that they know from FICE. So they're not allowed to really share that information. That information is considered privileged. It's considered uh, healthcare information protected under PHIPAA. So while my staff might know information about the person who's being considered for a treatment order, the lawyers and the legal team, they all have to access that through the regular pathways through health records uh, and that sort of search. But what it does is it helps us um, coordinate transfer dates better. So when someone becomes unfit, uh, goes through a fitness assessment or goes on a treatment order, our team knows about the dates from Old City Hall Court and can help the jail coordinate the, the dates that they're needing to be sent out. We can help coordinate CAMH when the next bed is available. Once we're confirmed that they're going into uh, the CAMH bed, the workers uh, at the ATU or the SOTU units, which house those, those clients, can see the FICE history on the chart. They do then have a rich, fulsome understanding of the previous treatment or presentation of the client. The limits, of course, is that we're only stationed at Old City Hall Court, so we don't actually have uh, our, our team, our court liaisons don't have a direct connection to the Finch courts. So it is a it, it is limited and and um, in who we can coordinate with. But the 102 court has worked out very well. Another offshoot of our FICE program, something that has grown uh, from it is that we were able to secure funding for what we now call the acute care stabilization bed. I think it's been operational now since 2018 and of course with COVID things had a little bit of a hiccup but um, in terms of our pathway what it is is there's there's funding I think for a total of five beds. We currently have one operational um, and this bed is meant to provide a direct transfer from Toronto South, so the, the male clients that we work with, to uh, what we would call secure treatment, a secure treatment facility under a Form 1. So as you can imagine, the clients that um, become acutely unwell here, um, because of their legal situation, they when they're brought to emerge, they show up with shackles, orange jumpsuits, two escorts, you know, officers from the jail, and it's quite a production when they enter. You know, the closest hospital being St. Joe's, or you know, if they end up uh, going over to uh, smaller hospitals or St. Mike's, they have they have um, they have to go through the general emerge, which can be quite jarring for the general populate, general public to see, but also quite labor intensive in terms of safety and security and the dignity of the, the client who's being taken to, to a hospital. So this pathway is one where if the client is deemed unwell and actually can be placed on a Form 1, we discuss the clients here at the Toronto South each week and we make a wait list and we try to coordinate uh, that they go directly to our SOTU unit, our secure unit. They are triaged here before they leave and then they're triaged and screened again as they enter the SOTU unit. But once they're housed there, the officers can leave and the client can receive treatment in a safe and secure setting. We aim for that treatment to be less than uh, approximately three weeks or a little less. It's a precious resource. It's meant to be a stabilization bed, not a full recovery bed. 
So what it's meant to do is try to stabilize that client, restart their medications, uh, give them an opportunity to kind of get well, and then we will have to return them back to the Toronto South, but hopefully functioning much better. So that bed has been a very precious resource. And as you can imagine, with 1,200 inmates here on any given day, there's always more than one client who needs to be sent out and treated under, ment under the Mental Health Act, the Form 1. Uh, so those five beds, when they do become fully operational, I have no, um, I, I am sure they'll have no problem being filled. Vanier has a similar pathway, but their their agreement is with Ontario Shores. So the FICE team at Vanier is not uh, currently involved in that transfer. But just to know that those beds have also been rolled out for the women at Vanier. So this is just a little bit of the data. I mean, we've been opened. This is a snapshot before COVID. So from 2018 to 2020, uh, we had 731 days of operation, 38 clients admitted. The bed utilization was 92%. The average length of stay was just under three weeks, 17 days. Um, and they, the admission score, which is a tool we use called the CGI, uh, CGIC, that rates like the severity of the of the illness. We kind of rank our clients in terms of acutely unwell, severely unwell. So it's, it's a quick tool. It's just a, a Likert scale. And uh, on admission, their scores were as high as six. And at discharge, they were uh, average decreased probably down to a four or three. So you can see that um, they, they return much more uh, settled, feeling better, and usually starting medication, oftentimes a long-acting injection, or uh, they may have had a complete med readjustment and restarted various things. The other opportunity that has come from the FICE service, uh, and again, it's we were able to provide very specialized training, mental health training, to the corrections officers who worked in the mental health units and at the mental health unit in Vanier. So there was about 100 officers that we trained. Each one received two days of training. Uh, and it was a training that was provided by myself, an OT from our program, and our psychiatrist. So it was a very healthcare heavy training where we delivered uh, information about what is a mental illness, how do you manage risk, what signs do you look for for suicide, what kind of things would you look for for depression, what kind of things do you look for for substance use, with the intention, of course, of, of, of reminding these officers, we're not expecting them to be healthcare professionals, but we do want them to be able to recognize when a client is being um, difficult or unruly, the motivation can be different than just being, uh, you know, anti, uh, you know, sort of antisocial. The, the motivation sometimes is, is out of fear, is out of health reasons. It's not just to be disagreeable or hostile. So we try to explain that. We try to give um, examples of what schizophrenia may be, what what does uh, manic depression look like, just so that they were they were able to recognize that not everybody is uh, being hostile and aggressive uh, because they're they're antisocial or anti-authority. There's other motivations for people's behavior. And the, the, the feedback that we received from the officers was really, really supportive. They, they wanted us to do it again next year. It was a one-time thing that we were able to offer because we had a grant. Um, and so what then corrections did when they saw how much of a, a need there was and the demand for it is they did contract with CAMH Education Services and our psychiatrist, along with a few other people, developed an online training and videos that now all the correctional officers receive in their orientation to becoming a, a corrections officer at the college. So it led to um, sort of some permanent education that has now sort of become standardized. The other thing I should mention is those tools that we use, the Brief Jail Mental Health Screener and the JSAT. While uh, Toronto South and Vanier are the only two organizations at the moment that have a FICE team, all remand facilities across Ontario are mandated, and they have been since 2017, to use the brief jail screening tool and the JSAT. So while at our team, the FICE, at our services, the FICE team does that, at the other institutions, the social workers take on the task of doing the JSAT. And uh, the brief jail mental health screener still happens by the organizational 
nurses at A&D, but then they refer directly to the institution's uh, social workers to complete the JSATs. So we've made lasting changes in those two areas as well. Here are some of the numbers that we've had for the last little while, and it's also interesting to reflect that uh, during COVID, believe it or not, our numbers, even though the number of admissions may have decreased over time and there was an effort from corrections to not, you know, house as many people in prison, our ability to see people uh, actually improved. And that's, uh, that's solely based on the fact that court became much different. So people were no longer leaving the institution. Video court was being implemented. And so when we saw a person on Monday, uh, when a person was admitted on a Monday, we could go down and see them on Tuesday. They wouldn't be out at court. They'd be in the institution. And if they had court, it would be on site. So it really gave us even more access to people. Um, on a typical day, for example, uh, FICE is not in, in the institutions on the weekends as of yet. But on a Monday morning, uh, we could come in and have 30 referrals waiting for us at the Toronto South. So the people were admitted on Friday night, Saturday and Sunday. Maybe about 30 of those would be waiting for us or 35. Uh, by the time we went to see them, we might only see 20 of them because uh, Monday afternoon, people will be out at court. And like I said, now it's much different. Maybe out of 30, only 25 have been released or 28 even. So it's really led to us being able to see people uh, a little more than we expected in the past. So if you look at the, uh, the numbers here, the admissions at the Toronto South Detention Centre for 2020, 5,078. 2,163 referrals were given to FICE at uh, that year. And we will screen and triage as many people as we can. So as you see that we received uh, 2,163 brief jail screeners. And from that, we were able to see 1,775 inmates, so 82%, whereas the year before it was only 61% we could see. And then if you look at the number of clients that we kept on our case caseload, so you're thinking about that 2%, the top of the triangle, we were able to keep uh, 489. So it doesn't change, it didn't change much about who was acutely unwell, but it did change how many people we could, uh, we could actually capture to do a JSAP. At Vanier, things are a, a little lower, of course. There's less people, less beds. So in 2020, we saw 1,962. We had 1,131 referrals. So the number of women referred to us at Vanier is very high. Uh, you know, out of 10, we probably get seven people that have triggered the screener. Uh, the term that the researchers use is kind of like a false positive. And what we mean by that is, you know, the, the tool is very sensitive for women because women are historically are more often uh, open to asking for help, more likely to receive help, more likely to share their feelings. So we do get a large number of people that, uh, that trigger the screener at Vanier. And then we were able to complete 955 JSATs, so 1,100 brief mail, a brief jail mental health screeners and then 955 JSATs. And from there, we, we managed about 200 clients through the system and the forensic system. So still pretty high numbers. The work, the work is um, ever changing, very quick pace. The, the uh, process that we use is very much formalized that we have our check-in in the mornings and our check-out in the afternoon. That happens every day, rain or shine. So that kind of piece of it is very predictable. Um, the challenge, of course, for the clinicians is managing the caseload that they have that's current and they need to follow up with, along with taking new referrals every day. So it is a big juggling act in terms of being able to see new people and manage the ongoing clients. So again, as some of the some of the future things, considerations, things that we, we try to look at is, you know, the length of stay is very short and I don't know if there's any better way we can capture people uh, to do longer term planning. Right now we have no way of working in the community. We're solely based um, on pre-sentenced clients who are here and housed. So there's no, we, we, we share uh, and refer to the community partners such as CMHA, CODA, uh, you know, St. Mike's outreach teams, we, our, own, our own outreach teams. 
but the FICE worker is not able to follow up and go to court or help uh, help bridge services to get them to an appointment or any of that stuff. So the length of stay and the amount of time we can have an impact on the client is short. Some of the clients have multiple admissions, so they get released on a Friday, we see them next Wednesday. Those are very sad. Uh, you know, the, the term is kind of like frequent flyers, and these are people who are often chronically unwell, disorganized, but yet for some reason don't really trigger the Form 1 Mental Health Act. They're not a danger to themselves and others, but they're living in shelters, they're staying on the street, they don't follow up for medication, they more than likely are homeless or underhoused, um, and their ability to sort of navigate the systems or be involved with uh, care is, is very limited. Uh, we also see a lot of substance use uh, that would sort of lead to that as well. Another one of the challenges we have, of course, is that we're a consent-based service. And so while that's really important for clients' uh, rights, it does sometimes lead us in difficult situations where people are so acutely unwell that they say no, they don't want us. We do try two or three times. We kind of have a little rule about that. We'll we'll try another pass by to, to see if another staff or the physician can help engage them. But if they refuse us, they refuse us. And so sometimes we do watch people languish and not get quick access. We do have a system that's built in with the Toronto South and at um, Vanier. And what it is is that when those things happen, we flag it for the healthcare teams at the institution. And while FICE cannot really comment at court, the uh, corrections institution can send what they call a critical information exchange to the crowns and to the, to, the, to the mental health courts saying, hello, we're worried about this person. They seem to be experiencing symptoms of mental illness, which is interfering with their ability to come to court. So that information comes from the court, goes to the court from the corrections side. So FICE can't intervene in that level, but the, the other side can. And so we work together to, to try to flag that at, at all times. But it does limit our reach. It does make it a little difficult sometimes to have to pass messages on to the uh, corrections side, who then has to pass it on to the, to the courts. The other sort of shortcomings to this model or what can be seen as a shortcoming by people who do work in corrections is that in the beginning when we talked about bringing mental health care to prisons, one of the things everybody on certain sides of the table, not everybody, but a lot of people at certain sides of the table really wanted the mental health units to somehow be deemed a Schedule 1 facility so that inmates with mental health issues could be treated on site just like they can be in hospital. And of course, that didn't happen. That wasn't the political will or the structures of our program. So treatment cannot, cannot occur in a correctional setting. They do need to go through the court processes. They do need to fall through, follow through the Mental Health Act and be sent to a hospital to be screened and seen. And as you know, there are bed shortages all across the hospital uh, in, in the GTA and, and surrounding areas. So there's a lot of bed shortages. Our clients are highly stigmatized, highly visible, and it's very intense to move them because we're having, you know, officers escort them. We're seeing them in the merge in the general population. And so there's a lot of disruption to, to community hospitals who are receiving these clients. So that's that's a that's a piece that still happens, right? Even though we have those that one bed and even though we have a FICE team, the demand for hospitalization and the need for hospitalization for some of these clients is, is you know, it's going to be it's still going to be high. If, like I said, 1,200 inmates, you're looking at maybe 10 people a week that could have a bed for a short period of time that they don't have access to. And then, of course, the other challenges that kind of comes to this program is the idea of the Mental Health Act and how it applies to these clients. So who are considered formable under a Form 1? So on a street corner, if you have somebody ranting, raving, screaming, disorganized, shouting insanities, upset, disheveled, poorly dressed in the middle of winter, uh, the police can take that person to a hospital and say, hey, this person's at risk. He's at risk of hurting himself or he's at risk of hurting others. If you're standing in a cell, you know, eight by eight, yelling, screaming, naked, smashing around your food tray, are you really at risk of hurting others? Are you really going to be able to hurt yourself? Um, the need changes, right? It's a little different and it's seen differently under under the Health Act. It's seen differently when you arrive in a merge. 
they assume that you can contain that client. You can. They assume that you're able to treat that client. So the bar to send somebody out on a form one suddenly gets higher. And that's where you see people eating their own feces, drinking urine, naked, maybe not eating, not eating at all. So maybe other blood sugars are going off. You have health issues that are starting to be impacted. That's the kind of person who then gets sent out on a form one. Those people that I mentioned earlier, the acutely psychotic, those quiet people who sometimes just self mutter and don't talk and shut down but are eating and drinking, it's really difficult to just send them out on a form one if they're able to sort of practice the, the basics of daily living. They te technically doesn't look like they're hurting anyone, but they're suffering in silence. So those clients suffer more here because if they're out on a street corner wandering, they'd be able to be on a form. But when they're here, it's different. They're contained. So there's a lot of limitations and a lot of things that are bigger than us and bigger than our service that affects our program. But these are some of the ways that they play out uh, with us. So I wanted to end with that idea that if anybody who works in the justice system, we're always having to think about stigma. So not only are our clients stigmatized, the officers who work with those clients at times are stigmatized and seen as different. And um, the media has never been really kind to corrections. So while working here, I, um, you know, I see what happens in the newspaper and I hear what happens in the community. And I see the perception people have of the officers and the staff at the uh, at these correctional institutions. And I got to say that, it, like anywhere else, most of the people who work here are really doing their best. They really do have good intentions. They're doing good work. Of course, the ones who aren't are going to make the news. But not all officers are like what you see in the newspapers. Uh, not all clients are Hannibal Lecter, like we see portrayed in the in the media. And so the, the work that we do, we're facing not only the mental health stigma, but the justice uh, stigma. Our officers are showing up and emerge with cuffs and boots and, you know, batons and people are wondering like, what's happening. You know, they're thinking, thinking a whole different set of things and the officers are just trying to do their best to provide care and security when their training is all being about safety and protection. So uh, I just want to keep that in mind that what you see on the news is not always what happens for sure here on the inside. There's a lot of good work that is being done by some really caring people right from management down to the front lines with the officers and the officers have been so welcoming to our program. To be honest with you, when we first started in, in 2015, it was the officers who said, thank God CAMH is here. You guys know what you're doing. We sit here 24 hours a day with these guys. We're at a loss how to help. So they were so happy to have extra supports called in that could back up their teams and provide more time and more attention and more specialized training to the, to the clients that they see. So that's it. I'm going to turn it over to you guys if you have any questions or comments. I can't really see the, the chat box, but perhaps people could read that to me if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, for that presentation. It was very informative. I'm sure it'll be really helpful for a lot of us moving forward. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box. Does anybody have any questions? Doesn't seem so. I think you covered a lot of the questions that I had throughout your presentation. Um, so once again, thank you for taking the time to give us this informative presentation. I found it really helpful as, I, as I'm sure a lot of other people did. Just a reminder to everybody, if you can take just a quick minute to fill out the evaluation form um, and I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks again, Tanya.